Hey, everybody. Welcome to Your Money Map, sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. I'm your host, Jean Chatsky. And today we are, well, we're going to have a, a fairly wide ranging conversation about your personal finances. Um, we will open the door to talk about pretty much any topic you want to talk about. And as those of you who are watching on Facebook or LinkedIn know, we do that through the comment section. Um, we do it through chat. So hit me up with whatever questions you have. We'll weave them into the conversation. In fact, we welcome them. But we are going to start with taxes and we're going to do it for a couple of very good reasons. First of all, it's February. And February is the month, typically, where most Americans file their taxes. Your paperwork starts to roll in. You gather it together. If you're organized, you deal with it, you get it out of the way, but not everybody feels like that. In fact, studies have found that many Americans don't know the basics of filing their taxes, especially and understandably, given all the changes to tax law in recent years when they are quizzed by pollsters about things like common deductions and education savings plans and retirement people usually get half of the questions right, just half of the questions. And a, a recent Harris poll found that 46% of taxpayers don't even know what tax bracket they're in or even what a tax bracket is. An NPR poll found that only a third of Americans say that they understand a fair amount or more about tax policy and the list goes on. Bottom line, the vast majority of us believe that the tax code in this country is much too complicated. So we are going to deal with that today um, and take your questions. We're also going to talk about changes coming your way thanks to the SECURE Act, SECURE 2.0. We'll dig in a little bit as far as recent scams are concerned, maybe even talk about the money milestones that you should be thinking about at every age along the way. And we're going to do it all with the help of Michelle Singletary. Michelle is a personal finance columnist for The Washington Post. You all know her. Her award-winning column, which is called The Color of Money, has appeared twice a week in dozens of newspapers across the country. She is also a frequent contributor to NPR and CNN, and she is the author of four books, most recently, What to Do with Your Money When a Crisis Hits. We can all relate to that. Michelle, welcome. So glad to have you here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I always enjoy coming on your show. I always like talking to you as well. Um, and, and just a reminder, Michelle is here. So let's answer some questions too. Go ahead, pop them in the chat. Chat. We will be happy to, to tee them up. So when we're looking at 2022 as a tax year, it, I mean, it could be worse, right? There, there are not as many changes as in a lot of years. But what, what are you seeing that people are missing? What do you think is, is resonating and, and not resonating? What do we need to be paying attention to? I think this year, um, lots of people aren't going to get as big a refund as they may have been used to in the last couple of years because the stimulus payments have stopped. The beefed up uh, child tax credit is no longer there. Beefed up uh, earned income tax credit is no longer there. And so we're sort of going back pre um, pandemic to a lot of the same kinds of credits that you would have. And so already so far this year, refunds are down about $300. Um, and so that's one thing. Um, and I would just say, if you gathered all of your documents and you're ready, file as soon as you can, because the IRS is still dealing with a significant backlog. Um, and so you want to be sure that you get it in so that there is a problem. You've got time to rectify that. And I will say this triple, quadruple, a hundred times check everything because you do not want them to have to pull your return out of the pile uh, because that is going to be a significant weight, particularly if you are expecting a refund. Now, if you got to pay the IRS, they do not care. You better get that money to them <laughs> on time. It's only if you got a refund that that delay um, is going to impact you. So you still got to pay even if there's an issue. And lots of people actually don't realize that, particularly when they file 
out for an extension. They sort of feel like they've got an extension to pay. And that is just not the case. You got to pay, you know, when it's due on this year, April 18th. Let me um, unpack a little bit of what you just said there, because there was a lot of information. First of all, refunds smaller. Refunds have been averaging I don't know, as I've been tracking them the last couple of years, three-ish thousand dollars, but they're going to be smaller this year. That said, getting a refund year in and year out is not always the smartest move. I know a lot of people use it as a way to force themselves into saving a significant chunk of money each year. But what's what's the right way to look at this? And how do you get people to, to shift their behavior? Yeah, so, you know, I get a lot of pushback when I write, every year I write a column, it's like, please, y'all, stop getting these new, huge refunds. Because essentially what you're doing is you're having the government take too much out of your paycheck every two weeks or month, however you pay, and hold on to it and then you get, they give it back to you a year later. Now, when interest rates were super duper low, that might not have meant that much, you know, maybe $50 or $100. But now with savings accounts rates 3%, 4%, that's like a, you know, that's a significant chunk of money. But the other thing, the thing that it matters the most is if you're carrying consumer debt, I would even say a car loan or credit card debt or 401k loan or something like that. So you're, costing yourself money because you can't make souped up payments on that debt because you're letting the government hold on to it until April. And so this is particularly true if you're carrying debt. Just make sure you sit down with a tax professional. If you use the software, they will print out for you how much you should be, you know, paying or give you, you know, an idea of how much you should be putting into the system so that you get that money in your paycheck. The other thing is if you are not getting that money, you can't put it in the market. You can't invest. Right. It. And so you're losing your wealth on this forced savings plan. Now, if you are just like, look, chick, I'm just not going to do that. I just, I, I'm scared I'm going to owe the money to IRS. And secondly, I need that. Okay. I'm not going to, you know, criticize you too much, but just understand that there's opportunity loss that you are experiencing when you do that. So I'd rather you develop the discipline to get all your money that you're entitled to during the year so that you can either pay down debt, invest it, or do something else with it. Like maybe you could have that money. And so instead of putting the couch on a credit card, that's 20%, then you are paying cash for it. So just really think about how you're handling your money. And that's really what I tell people. This is all about, you know, making sure that you are disciplined enough that every dollar that you're entitled to, that you hold on to and you decide how to use it. You, you, interestingly, you said, talk to a tax pro about how much you really should be withholding. Let them run the numbers. They have the software. You didn't say, just go use the IRS withholding calculator. <laughs> It, the yeah. withholding calculator is better, but it, it's it's confusing. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, you know, I, I understand why people don't want to pay professionals because you figure I had a little bit of money. I'm not trying to pay anybody any money. But if you really can't, the, the calculator is much better than it used to be. Much, much better. And it really is only a problem if you've got outside income. It's a little harder to try to figure that out. But if you've got just a W-2 wage job, it's 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 much simpler to use. And the, and the, and the uh, when you go on IRS.gov, you put in a withholding calculator, it'll walk you through it. But if even after that, you're not 100% sure, this is a time to hire someone that says, listen, how much should I be taking out to make sure that, you know, you might want to get a small refund or owe a little bit of money. I'm talking, you know, a couple hundred dollars or less. Um, if you are just, um, and, and that will allow you to get that money in your paycheck. Um, so do both. If you do the calculator, you're like, then hire the professional. And again, the software will help you as well. If you just use the software, there's all kinds of tax software out there that will help you figure out how much you should be taking out of your paycheck. We got a question from Mary. She's paid through a 1099 for three different companies. So like a lot of people these days, Mary sounds like a gig worker. 
Um, she uses a home office or she's a consultant. Maybe she has expenses with all three and she tracks them. She files as a sole proprietor and her husband gets a W-2. But now she's hearing that if she had an LLC, she'd be able to save a lot more in taxes. And she wants to know if that's true. So, you know, I, I I hesitate to say that because I don't know all the things that go into your tax situation is Mary, right? Was it Mary? Yeah. Um, so I, this is a time where you, Mary, you cannot be, I'm a frugal gal. I just, I hate to spend money, but this is a time that you hire both an accountant and a tax person and let them look at, because what I find is lots of people who work for themselves get in trouble with the IRS because they're taking too much in deductions. Like that meal, it's not a hundred percent folks. I mean, a lot of the deductions are not credits. You know, deductions and credits are two different things. You know, a credit is dollar for dollar reduction. Deduction is percentage wise based on where you are in terms of your tax bracket. So lots of, you know, I'll have small business people say, well, I have a car and I write off the whole car. And I go, well, do you go to the store with that car? Do you go to church with that car? And they go, well, sure. I say, then you can't write off 100% of that car. <laughs> you right. know? Same with your office. It's the space. Like This is my home office. So I have outside income and I can write off the square footage of what I use. I can't write off my whole mortgage. And so, you know, that's why I'm saying you should sit down with someone and let them walk through all the things that you can claim as a small business owner, whether you're a sole proprietor or LLC. Really, the difference is LLC kind of protects you more from lawsuits. Um, I'm not sure there's a huge tax advantage between the two. There is an advantage to having it as an LLC, but it's not always directly related to the tax situation. What one of the one of the reasons why this idea of getting a, a refund is so troubling right now is that consumer debt is on the rise. Um, you, you wrote a column just today about balance transfer offers and how they might be a solution for some people. Are you are you worried about consumer debt and about the fact that things like auto loan delinquencies are going up? Mortgage delinquencies are starting to rise. Yeah. I'm very concerned. You know how I feel about that. <laughs> you and I talk about this all the time. Y'all, I hate debt so bad. Like if debt was a person, I would slap it. Like I hate debt. <laughs> and, and I was, my, my heart was singing actually during the pandemic, not because of what was happening to people, but during the pandemic, people were saving more because they couldn't go out and shop and use credit. And so actually, in I think it was April 2020, the personal savings rate hit a record 33%. So people were saving 30% of their disposable income. And now in December, it was back to like 3%. And I so I get it though, inflation, higher expenses, higher costs, people bridge that gap between their earnings and expenses by using credit. And I understand that. But I always worried, even as the savings rate was going up, that people will go back to their old habits. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're eating out more. You're, you know, revenge, traveling, all kinds of stuff that you know you cannot afford. And I don't necessarily mean that you don't have the money to make those monthly payments. I mean, every dollar that you spend servicing debt is not servicing to build up your wealth. Um, and so I'm extremely concerned. And the Fed of New York looked at that and found that, in fact, delinquency was uh, was increasing among younger adults, which is so concerning to me. So younger adults in their 20s and 30s are slipping into that 90 day uh, delinquency window, which means that they are overspending in their young life as they start out. And those are habits that are hard to kick. Yeah. If you start doing that in your 30s and in your 20s and 30s. So if you're doing that now, when you may not have all of the other um, obligations that us older folks have, you know, kids and houses and all kinds of stuff like that. Imagine what's not going to happen when you get married, and you have houses and you got to save for kids college fund. Um, and so I just you know, we live the American dream on borrowed money. Uh, and we have to kick this habit. And I'm not saying don't use a credit card, but if you cannot pay off that balance the next month, I don't care for what, 
uh, couch card, whatever, then you shouldn't be using that card. Yeah. And if you have to use it to, for your daily expenses, food, things like that, then there are other things that you might need to do to reduce your expenses. Amen to all of all of that. Um, I, I think I was probably the only other person but you who was like singing when the, the savings numbers went up to 33%. I was like, yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about the SECURE Act. SECURE 2.0 brought a lot of changes specifically relating to retirement. Um, what are the most important changes on the menu, the things that that are are making you happy? And, and by the way, you got a compliment in the chat. Colleen loved your book. So for all of you who are looking for a good financial read, um, go ahead and, and check out Michelle's latest. Uh, when we look at Secure 2.0, uh, there, there are a number of changes, uh, yeah. increased ages for RMDs, um, changes to the way that that um, people can save for things like student loans and emergencies. What, what are you paying attention to? So um, there's really two classes of people that are going to benefit from this. And the whole point of this legislation is to help people save for retirement. And so there are people who are doing really well. You're saving and you don't want to take that money out. And so there are provisions to help you with that. So whereas before it used to be like 70 and a half and 72. And now this year you uh, get to uh, up to 70 um, was it 73? And then eventually it'll be 75. So you can keep that money, keep it growing until you want to take it out. But the provisions that really make me so happy is the student loan one, which you mentioned. So uh, what I often tell young adults who are coming out of college with debt, because, you know, I want them to save for retirement and save right away. But if you've got a whole lot of debt, I'd rather you get rid of that debt first, because you still got some decades to go to save for retirement. And so that was a hard thing to say, knowing that I still want them to save for retirement. And so although I would tell them to maybe not put money in retirement, but put in enough to get the employer match, that still might be too much for them. So now Secure Point 2.0 says that if they're making a student loan payment and an employer offers a match, they can actually match what they make in a student loan payment so they don't have to give up that match. I love that. Now, no one's making student loan payments on federal debt right now, but when they do start kicking back in, that's a huge boost for young adults. And I love that. There is a savings component to it now. So you can put in, um, you can take out a thousand dollars without that nasty 10% penalty because lots of people don't save for retirement because they don't want to lock up their money. They're living paycheck to paycheck. They're like, look, I cannot be putting no money in retirement because I might need it to fix my car. And so now there's an ability for them to take out that money without being penalized. And there's a savings account component as well. So they can save up to $2,500. That's great too. And if they save more than that, it goes right into their retirement account. And I really, really, really love that. Um, so there's a lot of little incentives for people to save for retirement. Uh, and that is just, y'all, that is so important to do that as soon as you can, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s. And listen, if you reach to 50 and you haven't, it's not, it's not too late. It's never too late because you still need to add to whatever you might get from Social Security or if you are lucky enough to have a pension. Um, you know, my young adult, yeah, I've got three young adults. They're all living with us. And one of the reasons why they're living with us is their deal. This is the deal. We won't charge you rent. We don't charge you utilities. We don't even charge you for food. If you put in the max that is recommended for your retirement account. And for the oldest right now, it's 15%. She's putting 15% of her money in her retirement account. And um, my son, he hasn't doesn't have a full-time job yet. But when he does, that's going to be a requirement for him. And the youngest one, she's going kicking and screaming, but she's about to do it as well, 15%. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it is, she's it like, let me get so used important. to my first salary first, but she's going to get, get in there too. Otherwise, I'm going to start charging her rent. <laughs> there, oh, there you go. That's that's the way that's the way it works in Michelle's household. There are there are definitely rules. One, one of the other changes, and this one actually came through the pike in the earlier SECURE Act, was the um, ability for 401k plans, um, retirement plans, to add annuities to mm -hmm. the menu. And it contained a requirement called, I, I think it's the, the lifetime dis disclosure requirement is the, is the full name of it. But basically, if you are starting to see 
in your um, 401k literature and statements, um, how your benefits would look when paid out as a lifetime income. This is why. Um, and we're starting to hear from some younger people that uh, these numbers don't look big enough. They're, they're getting discouraged. Yeah. What do you say to them? It is very discouraging. And, and, but I want, I don't want them to be discouraged because what I really want them to see is a way to kick them in the pants, right? Because if you see, because sometimes when we look at the average in retirement accounts, it's probably what now with the market down, like maybe 150,000 or something around there yeah. on average, right? And so you're thinking, well, that's a large amount of money. But it's not if you're only going to be pulling two to three, maybe four percent of that. And then, you know, on a monthly basis, it's not a lot. So when they see that number, they get, well, wait a minute, that is not going to that's not going to help me through, you know, decades of retirement. And so I like I hope that they see it as an incentive to save more. And I think it behooves you and me and and the plan administrators to to drive home that this is you're at the beginning of your savings. So don't get discouraged by looking at this because oftentimes when people get discouraged, they just stop because they think there's no way I'm going to meet this. And so I think the language we all have to say is use this as a way to push you to save more. Uh, and it, the sooner you do it, the more you have and you don't have to save as much. So my younger daughter is doing 15%. So she does that now. She won't be having to do, you know, 20 or 30% when she's 40, when most people can't put that much in their retirement account. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But for people at the other side of the age curve, right, people in their 50s, maybe their kids are out of the house or even in their uh, 60s when they're in the last few years or their last decade of work. Um, by the same token, I think using this lifetime disclosure as a kick in the pants to make the best use possible of all the catch up contributions that That's you possibly right. can is also a good idea. That's right. That's right. And and the new legislation actually allows you once you hit your 60s to even put even more. I think now the top is what, 7,500 and, and now it's going to go up to 10,000 under the new uh, provisions. So there's lots of things in the law. There's lots of people pushing you. And, you know, I get it. Like, I understand. I didn't come from any. So I know what it's like to struggle. I actually know what it's like to be hungry. And when you're looking at shaving off, you know, a hundred, 200, 300 every paycheck, you're thinking, I, I can't, I can't do that. But you can't afford not to do it if I could use a double negative. Yeah. Um, and that might mean changing your housing situation. It might mean, you know, multi-generational housing. It might mean staying in your hometown instead of venturing out someplace else where you don't have the resources. So, you know, you, you, you you're a young adult, maybe you got kids. You're like, well, I want to go to the you know, West Coast and you live on the East Coast. But all your folks, all your people, all your helpers on the East Coast, you got to make different decisions that as you look down the road. Uh, and then I'm trying to discourage people from following their dreams. But realistically, um, you just want to look at what can you afford and how will this play out over the years? I, I, I got to tell you, I was in um, I, I was in the hair salon um, the other day and this young man who was blowing out my hair um, was telling me his story. And he was a student at um, a local college here in Philadelphia, a student at Drexel University in, the, in, in a, a film and television program and definitely in his early 20s. And I said, all right, so explain this to me. Explain to me how you're doing my hair. And he said, well, I thought about how I was going to afford college. I'm first generation. I knew my mother was going to go back to Puerto Rico, where we're from. I knew I was going to have to do this on my own. So I went to cosmetology school first mm -hmm. and I figured I would work through college, get myself through college by working what is essentially a full time job. And I was just so impressed by mm -hmm. his, you know, that you don't hear that a lot. You certainly you certainly don't hear it enough while we're talking about different people at different ages. You recently collaborated with your peeps at the Washington Post on a, a series of milestone money steps. Mm -hmm. um, 
people who are in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way up. These are the things that Michelle knows from her years of reporting and knowledge are the are the must do's are the things that um, that you don't want to miss. And I'd encourage everybody to take a look at it um, because there are pictures of Michelle at every age, <laughs> illustrations of Michelle at every age, and they're really fun. Um, how did you decide? I mean, you've been reporting this stuff as long as I have, and and you have enough information in you to fill more than four books. How did you decide what were the most important items to hit at every age? So I really uh, use the readers. Um, I thought about the questions that I've been asked over the years. Uh, and we didn't want, we wanted to manage people's expectations. because it's not gonna be every person finding a question you ever need to ask in your twenties to your nineties. But the big stuff, you know, do I, you know, do I, do I save or pay off debt? Um, when do I talk to my kids about my money as I'm getting older? Um, when should I buy a house? You know, if I'm living with someone with a partner, how do we handle the money? Just the, the questions that I've gotten over the years, and we want to, we wanted to organize it based on the questions that would be more uh, germane to your decade. So there's actually more questions than 20 decade because that's when you're starting out. If you get it right in that decade, you're you're gonna be a millionaire by the time you retire, and then. But if you're not okay, you're 40, you look up. I have not saved anything with time. What in the world do I do? Um, and and so we what so that's what I do. I just use the people who come to me and the questions that they ask. And the beauty of this project is a living project. We just added a 90s decade because we thought 80 and plus that's gonna be good enough. But when we looked at the numbers, a reader wrote to me and said, Hey, what about you know 90 year olds? And so we added a section because it's true that that age population 90 to 100 um, is growing because of you know better technologies and, 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 and health, um, issue, you know, being able to be healthier longer. Um, and so that's how we divide it up. It's so easy to use and we're going to be adding to it on a regular basis. So if you've got a question, you look through the project and it's not there, like someone said, and we hadn't even thought about this. Should I put my pet in my will? <laughs> you know, who, who what did thought, you say? Right? What, what did you say to answer that no. question? Yeah, you definitely can, but you can't leave your money to Fido, right? You can't say give Fido $100,000 because Fido is considered property. And so you would have to set up a pet trust. Who knew, right? A pet trust so to leave the money to someone to take care of the cat or the dog. Um, now, I, I'm not I'm not paying money for no pet trust. <laughs> I asked my sister or brother, you going to take care of my dog? <laughs> and I'll make sure there's money given to them to take care of the dog. But, you know, if you, you know, people's pets are like family and someone wanted to know, how do I take it? And then another gentleman, and this we added to the 90s card, was should you prepay for your funeral? And what's you the know? answer there? And so I think you shouldn't, because uh, I mean, if you're worried about not having people to trust, it's called a pre-need contract. But the problem is, what if that funeral home or goes out of business? Uh, and so I would rather you put money into like, say, a savings account with a payable on death to someone you trust. So you would put the money that you expect to pay for your funeral in that account, you control it. And then upon your death, that money is then dispersed. It, it doesn't have to go through probate. It goes to a person that, you know, your oldest kid, who's the, the responsible one or your sister or uncle or whatever. And they use that money to pay your funeral. Or you could get a life insurance, a term life insurance policy and make it pay out to the beneficiary who will take care of your funeral expenses. And so that's how we're doing it um, because you just never know what businesses and then different states have different laws about how the money is handled, whether it's going to stay in escrow, who has control of the escrow. So I'd rather you keep control of that money. And quite frankly, I'd rather you really think about the whole funeral thing anyway. Do you really need all of that stuff? <laughs> and I talk about how my grandmother planned my grandfather's funeral when he passed away. And it was an amazing conversation. And I, it was actually quite funny. She, she's sitting with the funeral director and he's trying to get her to buy some expensive casket and he's flipping through the you know expensive section and she flipped right back to the basic boxes and he said something to her well don't you want to bury him in dignity or something like that and she looked at him she said he's dead 
He is not going to know what he buried in. <laughs> and I was a little taken aback myself. But you know what? I thought about it. She's absolutely right. And so he said, well, you know, we got these bouquets of flowers. And she said, well, why? He can't smell none of them. And so she was so practical because what she knew is that as a widow, she's going to need that money to live. Mm -hmm. And so she wasn't going to let this person guilt her into spending more than she could afford. And so I write about that in the mouth. So, you know, and if you want an elaborate funeral, that's fine. Make sure you have the money to pay for it. Don't leave it on the responsibility of your relatives, but it's okay. There's a card in there now. It's being cheap if you want to be cremated. And it's not, it's not. Too much. Well, there's a, there's a reason that cremations are on the rise and cost, cost is a very, very big part of it. Um, that's right. One of the questions that I get asked most often is from women who are wondering, all right, I, I've got this sum of money. How am I going to make it last as long as I do? How do I how do I address this this fear that won't go away that I am going to run out of money before I run out of time? Is that question in your project? So we haven't added that. And you're probably talking about lifetime income annuities. We don't really have a question in there about that. And that's one of the ones that I, I need to add to that. Um, so we mostly talk about, because I honestly really don't get that question that much, but it is one that we need to address. And I think that if you don't feel that you're savvy enough, if you are truly worried that annuities are appropriate for some people, not all. And I believe that you need to do a lot of research and homework before you let someone talk you into this because it's got to be appropriate for you. Yeah. Um, and and that I think that's the message. And then secondly, understand the fees. Um, and I don't think the industry does a good enough job in really being transparent about the fees. And I think people are afraid to ask. And because really, we for the longest time thought that our financial advice came for free, but it didn't. So as long as the fees are disclosed, people understand what they're buying. They understand the product. They understand what they're giving up, the pros and the cons then if that's the right decision for you, if you're going to not be sleeping at night, if you need to know that you're going to get the set amount of money and not worry about the market, then that may be the right product for you. I, I think actually what you said about understanding the fees and understanding what you're buying is the best universal advice for yeah. anything, for any investment, insurance policy. You know, I wouldn't buy a toaster if I didn't understand how it worked, right? So That's right. I think this is this is amazing advice. Um, Heidi says, all good points on funeral planning, especially on keeping it simple. For folks who may need Medicaid, the options for reserving funeral funds may be different during due to Medicaid eligibility rules. Um, state aging and disability resource centers can provide specifics of these rules at no cost. Um, thank you. For that, Heidi, really good, really good information. Um, Michelle, we are just coming out of a out of a crisis. Um, at hopefully, um, the the last crisis for a long time, but but crises happen. Um, and so, as you um, as we wrap up this conversation, um, give me a page from your book. Uh, your what to do with your money when a crisis hits. What's what's the what's the thing every single person needs to do? So the book's uh, premise is that it's not a matter of if there'll be another crisis, but when. And so it's structured like an FAQ and it's really structured for people who I have lost my job. I have nothing. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I get resources to people who are still doing well, even though the pandemic has hit hard a lot of people? There are a lot of Americans who are doing well and the message to them is that you're doing well as long as you're doing well. And so you always need to be planning for that crisis, not out of fear, but just, you know, being aware that we can't protect ourselves from everything. Um, and so that's kind of where I come from. That's what you do. It's all about planning and understanding. And you may not get all this money thing. It may just be a whoosh, but I'm telling you, don't do anything until you have investigated, you fully understand. Don't let people sell you anything. Mm 
You need to take control and read. And I mean, watch, you know, I love Jean's website. I love what she does when she's on air. She just talks in a way that is so, she doesn't talk down to you. She explains it. Listen, read her, read me. I mean, we are trying to help you. And that's really what the book is, is just say, pause, think about what you want to do and, and make sure it is in your affordability wheel. And, and really, if you do those things, you'll, you'll be okay for the most part. But I explain it like this. My husband is a golfer and he buys these really nice, sturdy golf umbrellas. It drives me crazy because they're a little expensive. I'm a dollar store girl. I'll get an <laughs> umbrella from the dollar store, but that dollar store umbrella is only good for a light rain. His umbrella, his golf umbrella, if it's a big storm, it's not going to necessarily keep him from getting wet, but it's going to keep him from being drenched. And that's what the book is about. That's what I try to do. I'm trying to keep you from being drenched. I can't protect you from everything but I can keep you from being drenched. So in that case, you need the golf umbrella, <laughs> not the dollar store umbrella. The dollar store umbrella is what somebody told me, or I heard, or they said, or the salesman said, that's the dollar store umbrella. That umbrella will make you get drenched. And that umbrella will make you buy 20 more umbrellas because it's going to break every time, that's every exactly time you go right. out. <laughs> Michelle Singletary, where can we find more of you and more of your work? Well, you know, start at the Washington Post website. I would love for you guys to, to read the Milestone Project. And from that, you'll get access to, you know, the rest of my columns. And I know you might hit a paywall. That's a big thing right now. Uh, but it's a small amount of money for really good unbiased information. And so if I could just put a pitch for both of us, you know, every time you go to do anything with your money, turn, read, read Jean's, her money, oh. right? And, and then go and read my archives. You look at the Milestone Project because we are not... We are not trying to steer you into something that is going to be detrimental to your financial health. And so that's the best way you can help me is just go to the Washington Post website and read what I have to do because I'm in it with you, right? I'm like yeah. many of you who are watching, uh, just trying to make do with what I have. And by the way, if you've never subscribed to the Washington Post, they always have a really, really inexpensive offer to get you in the door. So you can just you can just take advantage of it. Leslie says she subscribes to the Washington Post just for your column. So thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you. for Thank you for that. Thank you for this, Michelle. For anybody looking for more information from the Alliance for Lifetime Income, you can find it at protectedincome.org. And for more information on this conversation specifically protectedincome.org slash Singletary. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.